Alright, so let's look at the 2012 multiple choice questions. So, we've got a classic uh, impulse momentum type question to start with. So, the graph shows how the force acting on your body changes with time. Uh, okay, and its mass is 0.25, and it's initially at rest. What is the speed after 40 seconds? So, the change in momentum is the area, so it's only half base times height, so half times 40 times 10, and that's 400 over 2, so that's going to be 200 newton seconds. And then, so the velocity is going to be that uh, divided by the mass, so 200 divided by 0.25, which is 800 meters a second, so answer C. Okay, a stationary unstable nucleus. Ooh, unit 5. Oh no, we got it. Okay, of mass M emits an alpha particle of mass M with kinetic energy E. What is the speed of recoil of the daughter nucleus? Okay. So before it was stationary, so the total momentum is 0. So all we need is an expression for the momentum of the daughter nucleus, because then we, sorry, the alpha particle, because then we know the daughter nucleus would be the e in the opposite direction. So we know the kinetic energy is e, and we can also calculate it by doing momentum squared over to m. So that means that momentum is two m e, because the kinetic energy is e. So that would be the square root. <coughs> Now we know the momentum of the daughter must be the same value in the opposite direction. So we know the momentum of the daughter nucleus must be this value as well. So what we need is the velocity, which would be the momentum, so root 2me. But we need to divide it by the mass, so it's lost the alpha particle, so it's going to be the mass of the total minus the mass of the alpha particle, which is answer A. Okay. So two ice skaters initially at rest and in contact push apart from each other. Which line A to D in the table states correctly the change in total momentum and the total kinetic energy of the two skaters. So initially their total momentum is zero, which means the total momentum must be zero after, so it's not going to change. And the kinetic energy initially is zero, and afterwards... It, they both obviously have kinetic energy, so the kinetic energy is going to increase. It doesn't matter the kinetic energy is in different directions. The Earth moves around the Sun in a circuit orbit with radius 1.5 times 10 to the 8 kilometers. What is the Earth's approximate speed? So, so mv squared over r is equal to g m m over r squared so let's cancel those cancel those so we know that the velocity is going to be root g m over r so let's uh crunch those numbers the mass of the sun is in the formula sheet, so 2 times 10 to the power of 30, times 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11, divided by 1.5 times 10 to the 11, because it's in meters, and square root that answer. We end up with uh, 3 times 10 to the 4, which is option D. Okay, so, number 5, a particle moves in a circular path at constant speed, which of the following statements is correct? The velocity of the particle is directed towards the centre of a circle. Rubbish. It's not. It's tangentially. There is no force acting on the particle. Rubbish. Otherwise, it wouldn't be moving in a circle. There's no change in kinetic energy. That is true, because its speed stays the same. The particle has acceleration to on a tangent. No, it accelerates towards the centre. So it's option C. The diagram shows a smooth, thin tube through which passes a string with masses m and m attached to its ends. The tube is moved so that the mass travels in a horizontal circle of constant radius r 
at constant speed v, which one of the following expressions, expressions is equal to m. So we know if it's moving in a circle, the centripetal force, which is mg, will be equal to mv squared over r. So we want m would be mv squared over rg, which is, if I'm not mistaken, option c here. Um, the key thing here is that the centripetal force is being provided by the weight force of this m here. <coughs> a mass on the end of the spring undergoes vertical sympharmonic motion. At which point or points is the magnitude of the resultant force on the mass a minimum? So the resultant force will be the point where acceleration is zero, and in SHM, uh, acceleration is directly proportional to displacement, so it will be at the zero displacement. Um, so uh, what we're looking for, the, where the displacement is zero, which is at the center of the oscillation. Baby bouncer consists of a harness and elastic ropes, and it's suspended from a doorway. The baby has a mass of 10 kilograms, it's placed in the harness. The ropes stretch by 0.25 meters. When the baby bounces, she must start to move with vertical sympharmonic motion. What is the time period of the motion? So, let's try this one. So the key thing is here, we need to work out what the k is, but we know some key information for Hooke's law. So we know the force is 10g, and we know that the x is 0.25, so we know that k is going to be is 40g. So we can stick that into our equation, so we've got 10 divided by 40 times 9.81 square root times 2 times 5 pi and that gives you 1.0 so option A for this one here ok so let's move on to nine. a simple pendulum and a mass spring system both have the same time period at the surface of the Earth. If taken to another planet where the acceleration due to gravity is twice that on Earth, which gives the new time periods? Okay, so if you think about the time period of a mass spring system, it doesn't contain g, so it's essentially its own time period should end up not changing at all, so we can eliminate anything which shows the mass spring system changes. Now what we've done is we've gone from uh, root L over G to root L over 2G. So effectively what you've done is divided it by root 2. So that would be option C. An oscillatory system subject to damping is set into vibration by a periodic driving force frequency F. The graphs A to D, which are to the same scale, show how the amplitude of the vibration of the system might vary with F for various degrees of damping. Which graph best shows the lightest damping? Okay, so we'll be looking for the one um, that shows resonance but with the largest possible amplitude. So the two that show like what happens for resonance are not those two. So we're looking for the one of these two with the biggest amplitude, so it's going to be this one, option B. Which one of the following statements about gravitational fields is incorrect? Moving a mass in the direction of field lines reduces its potential energy. So effectively what you're doing is moving towards the centre, so that's correct. A stronger field is represented by greater density of field lines, that's true. Flux density and field strength are the same thing. Moving a mass perpendicular across field lines does not alter its potential, that's true. You're going around an equipotential line. A distance r, the field strength is inversely proportional to r. No, it's not. It's inversely proportional to r squared. OK, 
Okay, an object on the surface of planet radius r and mass m has weight w. What would the weight of the same object be when on the surface of a planet of radius 2r and mass 2m? So essentially we need to know what happened to the field strength. So the top line has been multiplied by 2 of your field strength equation. The bottom line has been multiplied by 4. So that essentially what you've got is g over 2. Um, so what's going to happen is the weight force is going to halve, so that's going to be answer B. Gravitational field strength on the surface of a planet is 8.0 newtons per kilogram. The planet and the star have a similar density, but the diameter of the star is 100 times greater than the planet. What would happen to the field strength? So first let's work out what happens to the mass. So if they have a similar density, but it's... 100 times greater, that's going to be mean the volume is 100 cubed bigger. So if it's a similar density, your mass is going to be multiplied by 100 cubed. Um, but then on your bottom line, you would have 100 squared because you got r squared. So you end up with essentially times by 100 which would be um, 800 newtons per kilogram. Two satellites, P and Q, of the same mass are in circular orbits around the Earth. The radius orbit of Q is three times that of P, so it's three times as far away as P. Um, so which of the following statements is correct? Kinetic energy of P is greater than that of Q. Yes, that's correct, because if you're closer, you have to be travelling faster. So that one's correct, so we can get that one straight away. Force between two point charges is F, and they're separated by a distance R. If the separation is increased to 3R, what is the force between the charges? That's a very nice, straightforward um, inverse square law one. So if you times the distance by 3, you divide the force by 9. Okay, the diagram shows the path of an alpha particle deflected by the nucleus of an atom. Point P on the path is the point of closest approach of the alpha particle to the nucleus. Which one of the following statements about the alpha particle on this path is correct? Its acceleration is zero at P. No, it's not. It's a point of maximum acceleration, actually. Uh, the kinetic energy is greatest at P, rubbish, it will be the smallest at P. Um, its speed is smallest at P, yes, that's true, it has reduced the speed in the least. And its potential energy is the highest at P, so that one's not correct as well, we can check. <coughs> a thousand microfarad capacitor and a ten microfarad capacitor are charged so that they store the same energy. The potential difference across the hundred micro Farad capacitor is V1, and the PD across the other capacitor is V2. What is the ratio? So the energy um, is equal to half CB squared. So if what's happened is you've divided the capacitance by 100, because uh, you go from 1000 to 10, which means that the V squared term needs to be times by 100 to cancel that out, which means each V would be times by 10. Um, so if we're looking at the ratio between the V squareds, it's going to be this value. So your V squared needs to be 100 times um, bigger, so that will be your answer B. The key thing here is they asked for the relationship between the V squareds, not the V, so it's the factor of 100, not the factor of 10. A voltage sensor and a data logger are used to record the discharge of a 10 millifarad capacitor in series with a 500 ohm resistor for an initial PD of 6 volts. You can do 1000 readings in 10 seconds. Which line HD gives the PD and the number of readings made after a time equal to the time constant of the, the discharge circuit? So the time constant is RC, so 10 times 10 to the minus 3 times 500. 
So that's five seconds, so it's going to make 500 readings. So we can eliminate the 50 reading ones straight away. So what do we want the potential difference? So if we do the time uh, at the time constant, so t over uh, the time constant will be 1, so e to the minus 1 times by 6.0 gives you 2.2 .2, uh, just using your discharge equation there. So we get answer D. Um, sorry, just to explain because I was saying that. What I was using there was this uh, equation here and T over T equals 1 when your time is the, equal to the time uh, constant. <clears throat> when a 220 microfarad capacitor is discharged through resistor R, the capacitor PD decreases from 6.0 to 1.5 in 92 seconds. What is the resistance of R? So we've got 1.5 is equal to 6 e to the minus 92 over R times 220. Uh, times 10 to the minus 6. So essentially we want to do all that in a reverse. So 1.5 divided by 6. Natural log that answer. Yeah, so that's equal to, what I've calculated would be equal to minus 92 over R. So minus 92 divided by my answer. Minus 92 divided by answer. And then what we want to do is divide that whatever we end up with by 220 times 10 to the minus 6. And what we end up is 300,000, so 300 kilo ohms, if you work that logic backwards. A section of current carrying wire is placed at right angles to a uniform magnetic field of flux density B. When the current in the wire is I, the magnetic force that acts on this section is F. Force acts when the same section of wire is placed at right angles to the uniform field of 2B, when the current is I. So, if we remember, force is B, I, L. So, we've times it by 2, but divided it by 4. So, we should end up with F over 2. Okay, a beam of positive ions enters a region of a uniform magnetic field, causing the beam to change direction as shown. What is the direction of the magnetic field? If it's causing it to the positive charge to curve to the right, so let's line this up with our Fleming's left hand rule. Um, so we've got the motion of the particle going to the right, will it deflect to the left? So the force must be acting to the right, or down to where I draw the page, which must mean the actual direction of the field must be out of the page and it's going to be perpendicular if the deflection is going to be downwards. So this is your Fleming's left hand rule here. You just line up your appropriate fingers for um, the direction of your current, the direction of the force that's acting, and you can see the field is acting out of the page perpendicular. Three vertical tubes made from copper, lead, and rubber, respectively, have identical dimensions. Identical strong cylindrical magnets, B, Q, and R, are released simultaneously from the same distance above the tube. Because of electromagnetic effects, the magnets merge at different times. So we can look here at the resistivities. So we can see that the one with the lowest resistivity would be copper, so that would have the highest current. The next high current would be lead, and you'd get basically no current in rubber. So you'd expect it to emerge first from the rubber, so... Uh, either we're now at either answer B or answer D. Then next you'd have the lead, lead which was Q. So we want the one which is going to be answer D.
that gives us um, the correct, correct sequence of them here, and it's all to do with the resistivity. Graph shows how the magnetic flux passing through a core changes with time. Which one of the following graphs could show how the magnitude of EMF induced varies? So we can see the gradient is increasing, so the rate of change of flux is increasing. So the only one that shows that is this option D, because your EMF is increasing, which shows the rate of change of flux is increasing. Using the circuit shown, and with the switch closed, a small current was passed through the coil X. The current was slowly increased using the variable resistor. The current reached a maximum value and was then switched off. The maximum reading on the microammeter occurs when small current flowed at the start, the current was being increased, the current is being switched off, and the current x is zero. So we're looking for the situation in which the rate of change of flux is greatest. So that's going to be when you switch it off because it's gone from very high to very low very quickly. So the rate of change of it is going to be maximum at that point. Mobile phone is being recharged, the charger heats up. The efficiency of the transformer can be as low as 15% when drawing a current of 50 milliamps from the 230 volt main supply. The charging current required is 350 milliamps. What is the approximate output voltage at this efficiency? So power in is 50 times 10 to the minus 3 times 230. Uh, power out is going to be the efficiency times by the power in. So let's calculate that to start with. 50 times 10 to the minus 3 times 230 times 0.15 gives you 1.725. Power is IV, so let's divide that by the current. So divide by 350 times 10 to the power minus 3, giving you a voltage of 4.9 volts once you rounded it which is answer a for this one and that concludes this video